Hi, I'm Geraldine Thomas. I'm the founder of Metropolitan Organizing. Professionally, I help athletes, politicians, artists, small business owners, and many more people live more productive, healthy, and balanced lives. If I sound familiar, you might recognize me from the show Hoarders on A&E. In addition, I've been on the Nate Berkus show, the Fine Living Network, and many other shows. The purpose of this call is to help educate you from a professional organizer's perspective as to what exactly a hoarding disorder looks like. Signs of hoarding may include some of the following things. Non-working utilities. Sometimes I've noticed driving through neighborhoods, there are people that don't open and close their blinds. The house stays dark. Um, sometimes they do that because there's no heat or there's no running water. Sometimes the sewer isn't working. Oftentimes, people with a hoarding disorder don't have refrigeration in their homes. If you never, ever see repair people coming and going, that might be a sign that someone inside is living with a hoarding disorder. There's also things to look for as you walk around your neighborhoods. Maybe there's um, long-term neglect that's evidence of, you know, somebody who's not maintaining their home. Sometimes you will have odors coming from homes. You will um, smell animal or human waste. Sometimes you'll have the um, pungent smell of rotting food or perhaps it's used food containers lying around. In extreme cases, there are rat and insect infestations. Sometimes if somebody does come to the door, they will never invite you in, and you might have a glimpse of just narrow pathways created in the home where exits, meaning doors and windows, are blocked. Sometimes in a garage, if somebody comes and goes, you will see large accumulations of combustible materials or stacks of newspaper, magazines, and rubbish that hasn't been rolled out to the curb. In general, just look for extreme collections and storage of items in the home or in the yard. Sometimes it's piled up on the front porch, on the side porch, or in the back of the home. So now what I'd like to do is share with you, um, at the time of this recording, exactly what experts on compulsive hoarding are using to define compulsive hoarding. So it's broken into a few different things. The very first thing is the acquisition and failure to discard possessions that appear to be useless or of limited value. So by compulsive acquisition, I mean that the person with the disorder is compulsively acquiring things, meaning they are buying them, they might be trash picking, or they might just be um, passively accumulating things, things that people are giving them, they feel compelled to save. That leads us to compulsive saving. And people who have tendencies to be compulsive savers have an extremely difficult time of letting go of items. Sometimes they claim the reason they hang on to things are for sentimental reasons. And oftentimes when people have sentimental attachments to things, we see that they are over-personalizing their objects. Sometimes they come up with instrumental reasons to save, meaning it's kind of that waste not, want not mentality. And then the third reason that people with hoarding disorders typically save things is because they see the intrinsic or beauty in everything. As an example, a client that I worked with was saving pieces of broken mirrors. He would hold them up and tell me how beautiful he thought they were and how each piece was unique and special and he couldn't bear the thought of letting go of something that just happens so randomly, an accidental, beautiful thing. Now that would be fine and dandy if this gentleman had room in his home and if he didn't have small children living with him and if he had a reason for saving these things other than just their beauty. But it was obviously not the safe choice while small children were living in the home. 
items that are useless or in such quantity or out of date make them absolutely useless. And it's these things that, as an organizer, we try to encourage people to think about letting go of. The second characteristic that defines hoarding is a person's living space is sufficiently cluttered and it precludes their intended use. So instead of cooking in a kitchen or sleeping in a bedroom or bathing in a bathroom, these rooms are not used for their intended purposes. Oftentimes we'll see random piles of things on a bed and the person can't sleep in their bed. Their logic is that anything out of sight is out of mind, so they believe that keeping things out in the open will serve as visual reminders. There's also a characteristic of people with a hoarding disorder to be completely indecisive about things. They have what's known as decision fatigue syndrome. They can make a few decisions. Oftentimes, they feel overwhelmed and exhausted and unable to make decisions. Sometimes you'll see people go through something called churning, where they make a decision, they change their mind, they go back and remake that decision, and they just continually second-guess themselves. If clutter isn't present in the living areas in homes, it's usually because of other people's efforts to keep these areas uncluttered. So when you have a married couple living together and one of the people has a hoarding disorder, oftentimes the other person without the disorder is responsible for keeping the house in order. And typically they're absolutely exhausted and worn out from uh, this nonstop effort to keep things where they belong. The third characteristic is the significant distress or impairment caused by the clutter itself. The accumulation of clutter and the difficulty discarding it causes a lot of distress and typically interferes with the normal use of the home, the everyday functioning, as I mentioned a minute ago, or just usual family and social activities. For example, there's never a sleepover if one of the parents has a hoarding disorder. The kids feel shame and embarrassment. Um, neighbors aren't invited in. Birthdays aren't celebrated. People don't show up on Friday evenings for, you know, pizza and cupcakes and normal things that other families are doing. There's also a significant health or safety risk in the home. The structural damage from the weight of having things in the house poses a lot of risks. So to summarize, what exactly is the definition of compulsive hoarding? It is the acquisition of and failure to discard possessions that appear to be of useless or limited value, living spaces that are sufficiently cluttered as to preclude their intended use, and significant distress or impairment caused by clutter. Now I'd like to take a moment and share with you a little bit more information about compulsive hoarding and differentiate it from what's often confused as hoarding. The first thing you need to know is that hoarding exists on a continuum. Most of us fall somewhere in the middle. So we have what people affectionately call neat freaks, messy people, pack rats, collectors, chronically disorganized people. So if you want to, visualize a number line. So there's the extreme left and the extreme right. For the most part, most of us fall somewhere in that bell curve in the middle. On the far left are your compulsive cleaners and your neat freaks, and then it gets just somewhat neat. Then we get into messy, chronically disorganized, and then to the far right would be compulsive hoarders. One of the questions I'm asked quite often is, how do I know if I'm a collector or if I'm chronically disorganized, if I'm a pack rat, or if I'm a hoarder? So my answer to that is, 
as a professional organizer, I'm not really concerned about your diagnosis. I'm called in to help with your symptoms, as are all professional organizers. We are not licensed, nor are we qualified to do any diagnosing. Only a licensed medical professional can diagnose any disorder. But with that being said, how I differentiate somebody with a hoarding disorder versus a collector is that collectors are often very proud to showcase their possessions. There is a method to their accumulating and acquiring whatever it is that they're collecting. So someone who collects vinyl, for example, would go out on the weekends perhaps and actively seek things to add to that collection. When you're visiting that collector, they're often really proud to show off their collection. They often have it alphabetized, color-coded, categorized. There are sometimes spreadsheets. They can tell you the value of certain things. They will tell you what's the most valuable thing in their collection, what's the least valuable, which ones have the most sentimental um, attachment. This is not true with somebody with a hoarding disorder. If you are ever in their house, you will notice that there is no rhyme or reason to the things that have been accumulated. You will often find a jumble of things. It's just a pile of stuff. It's as if they shopped and dropped it right there. So you will find perhaps the random vinyl or CD or stamp or doll or whatever it is that they've just purchased or acquired mixed in with things that have nothing to do with that. So the average kitchen counter might have, you know, a collectible stamp, a collectible doll mixed in with old food, pet supplies, toiletries, linens, all sorts of things. No rhyme or reason at all. One thing that's well known about the hoarding disorder right now is that it often coexists with other disorders. Some of the disorders that hoarding piggybacks off of are MDD, or major depressive disorder, SAD, social anxiety disorder, GAD, general anxiety disorder, OCD, obsessive compulsive disorder, and probably what I deal with most often is ADHD, attention deficit hyperactivity disorder. It's estimated that between 1 and 3 million Americans suffer from severe compulsive hoarding disorder. The most frequently hoarded items are newspapers and magazines, old clothes, bags from stores, books, mail, notes and lists, and memorabilia, meaning things that the person with the hoarding disorder is saving for sentimental reasons. I'd like to conclude by talking about the current treatment methodologies available today. The first thing I suggest you do is continue educating yourself about the topic of compulsive hoarding. Visit my website, metropolitanorganizing.com. Also visit the Institute for Challenging Disorganization.org. On their website, you'll find many free downloads and access to people throughout the country, professional organizers, who work with people with hoarding disorders. Most of all, I want to leave you with this message. This most likely will be a long and expensive process that's going to require a lot of patience and hard work. The goals are to do no harm, to be respectful, and to create a sustainable plan. Crews are going to be involved. Therapists, organizers, contractors, exterminators, all of these things add up. While hoarding isn't curable, it is manageable, and I wish you the best of luck dealing with your particular hoarding challenge.